Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I'm happy to be here. Uh, this is a, a talk. Is it really a general overview of, you know, facilitating the development and availability of medical countermeasures in general? Um, a lot, of course, since I work for the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Um, all of the regulatory mechanisms are also quite applicable to drugs regulated by the Center for Drugs Evaluation and Research. And um, because there is often some confusion with regards to who regulates what, let's uh, start there. So um, biological products regulated by CBER include blood, blood components and derivatives, vaccines, both preventative and therapeutic, allergenics, cell and gene therapies, tissues, xenotransplantation, and related devices. The public health challenges of the last few years, particularly H1N1 in 2009, as well as the still ongoing Ebola outbreak in West Africa, has forced FDA to change the way that they do business. So to encourage um, sponsors and to speed development of products, we've been holding as many pre-pre-IND as well as pre-IND meetings with sponsors as needed to facilitate the development of their products. We have increased our training and outreach, thus why Sally and I are here today, um, efforts you know, to attempt to modernize whenever possible. We also perform inspections or site visits of manufacturing facilities and, and manufacturing processes um, earlier in the review process if this would help get over some hurdles and move a product forward, perhaps um, getting it to the point where it might be able to be used in an emergency. However, FDA must pay careful attention to the risk benefit and the risk management issues and FDA does itself, is specifically in um, CBER, we do a lot of research. It, it started, CBER really was the Bureau of Biologics back in the day, and it became CBER in 1972. So at FDA, the research that we conduct is research aimed to assist in our regulatory review such as enhanced methods to measure an immune response or developing more rapid potency and other lot release assays. So we have found that our early and frequent consultation um, between the sponsors and um, the end user, if that is different, often with medical countermeasures, the end user is a US government entity helps speed products through the development process. Um, to advance development during an emergency, we work with sponsors as well as our um, colleagues, both at Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense, to gather data to allow for possible use in a declared emergency using the emergency use authorization provision under BioShield or for use under an emergency expanded access IND when that would be a more appropriate path in which to use um, a product. To accelerate products towards licensure, we have granted fast track pri priority review and accelerated approval processes for medical countermeasures. In addition, we work with our US government partners and industry and academia to develop animal models for um, products that in which the animal model is the only pathway in which to possibly um, allow for approval or licensure. So this sort of uh, puts things in context as the way things used to be and not the way things are with medical countermeasures or anything doing with Ebola. Um, Typically, uh, in a product development, there was about three meetings the FDA had with a sponsor. We would have a pre-IND meeting 
where we would go over a possible phase one protocol to be conducted in humans, um, any preclinical data, um, manufacturing data, we would have discussions with regards to this. And off a sponsor would go and they would conduct their phase one studies, then they would conduct their phase two studies, and we would have an end of phase two meeting. Here we would discuss the data that they had gathered to date in their phase one and phase two studies, and we would discuss the design and endpoints of uh, their phase three protocol. Nowadays, of course, if, if the animal rule was being used, we would discuss animal efficacy protocols at this point in time and have an update on our manufacturing and lot release. Then we would have one more meeting, and that would be a pre-BLA or a pre-biologics license application meeting, where we would discuss all the safety and efficacy data that they had gathered and um, any other manufacturing issues, as well as the outline of the application for approval or licensure. However, these days, we have many more meetings, as I've already noticed, and we have found that the early and frequent consultation improves the quality of the laboratory and clinical studies. It reduces misunderstandings and the likelihood of multiple review cycles. It improves the efficiency of product development. However, it's very resource intensive. So in CBER, we have developed specialized teams where Different people from different disciplines, whether it be clinical, farm talks, product issues, facility issues, form a review team. And they may be on more than one review team, but each review team focuses, say, anthrax vaccines, botulism vaccines, and these days, Ebola vaccines. Prior to the enactment of Project BioShield, which gave us the emergency use authorization that would allow use of investigational products in a declared emergency, FDA facilitated the implementation of protocols under IND for medical countermeasures that might be needed in certain, certain emergencies. In CBER, we referred to these as contingency use INDs. Um, however, use under an IND has the potential to be cumbersome in a widespread emergency because an IND requires the use of informed consent. This I, use under an IND in an emergency is still feasible for some medical countermeasures which don't have the data and information needed to meet the requirements in the law that would allow their authorization under an emergency use authorization. So for instance, should there be a lab accident or a single occurrence of an infectious disease that would qualify otherwise as a threat agent, then an unapproved medical countermeasure would have to be used under an emergency expanded access IND because a single instance doesn't rise to the level that would cause a determination and a declaration of an emergency by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Emergency INDs can be facilitated if there is some data to support use such as some safety data under a sponsor's or a government-held IND. Emergency use authorization provision has requirements that must be met in order to authorize the use of unapproved products or the uh, use, unapproved use of an approved product. It is important, though, of course, that EUA is not a regulatory mechanism, but rather a statutory authority. So here's all of our slides on emergency use authorization. Project BioShield was signed in law in uh, July of 2004. Under BioShield, the Secretary of Homeland Security or the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of HHS must determine that an emergency or the potential for an emergency exists. 
Following such a determination, then the Secretary of Health and Human Services can declare an emergency that could allow for an EUA for a particular product or several products. So in the recent case um, with Ebola, the declaration was made specific to diagnostic test that was not applicable to any vaccine in development or any therapeutic products in development. The declaration was specific only for the use of diagnostic tests to um, diagnose disease. Up to the passage of the Pandemic and All Hazards Preparedness Reauthorization Act in March of 2013, FDA could not pre-authorize use of a product. However, POPRA gave us expanded authority to allow us to issue an EUA before an actual emergency event if we determined that issuing that EUA would facilitate preparedness. Justifying the use of investigational products depends on the circumstances of the emergency or the potential CBRN threat, and the emergency must be due to a chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear agent. Authorizing use of a product under an EUA is um, allowed until the circumstances justifying the emergency use of the product no longer exist or the product has been approved for the use in which it was authorized. FDA can authorize the use of an unapproved product or an unapproved use of an approved product if the emergency is declared due to a CBRN agent that can cause a serious or life-threatening disease or condition and which there is no adequate available approved product or the approved product is not sufficiently available to treat the entire infected population. We must have enough evidence or in other words data to believe that the product may be effective and to determine that the product's known and potential benefits outweigh its known and potential risks. There are several conditions on emergency use authorization of a product. I already mentioned that there is no informed consent required. However, what we call fact sheets are required, not only for the recipients of the product, but for the people dispensing the product. So healthcare workers or recipients must be informed that this product has been authorized for emergency use, the significant known and potential risk and benefits and the extent to which they are unknown, whether or not there are any available alternatives, and the option to accept or refuse the product. FDA may impose additional conditions on the use of a product related to the requirement to monitor and report adverse events to the FDA, keeping records regarding who the product was administered to and reporting that to the FDA. The use and distribution can be limited to a certain population or subpopulation, so we could determine, for instance, that you know, pediatric patients or persons under 18 years of age could not receive the product. And there can be conditions on who is responsible for the collection and analysis of information. Okay, so there are several regulatory mechanisms that we have available to speed potential medical countermeasures towards approval. Fast track is a mechanism that is typically requested by the sponsor during the IND stage of development, and it applies to the development program for a specific indication. It is designed to facilitate the development and expedite the review of new drugs that are intended to treat a serious or life-threatening condition and that demonstrate the potential to address an unmet medical need. Fast track granted during the IND process can then allow for what we call a rolling BLA or rolling biologics license application or an NDA which would be a new drug application. 
which means we accept and start reviewing completed portions of an application as they are submitted. However, our review clock, all, all our activities have review clocks these days, our review clock doesn't start on the application until the application is complete. Priority review is requested by the sponsor at the time they submit the biologics license application or the new drug application or just prior. If priority review is granted, then we complete, do a complete review of the application within eight months. A product is eligible if it provides treatment where no adequate therapy exists or if it provides a significant improvement in the safety or effectiveness of treatment, diagnosis, or prevention of a serious or life-threatening disease for biologics, or if it provides a significant improvement compared to marketed products in the treatment, diagnosis, and prevention of disease for drugs. Most counterterrorism products, most emerging infectious disease products are all expected to qualify for priority review. For accelerated approval, as found in 21 CFR 314.510 and 601.40, a product is eligible if it provides a meaningful therapeutic benefit over existing treatments for serious or life-threatening illness. Approval is based on surrogate endpoints that are reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. Under accelerated approval, post-licensure or post-approval studies are required and usually ongoing at the time uh, approval is granted to demonstrate the effects on outcomes. FDA can pose restrictions on the use and distribution of products approved under an accelerated approval. We have found that the sponsors have had trouble in the past um, obtaining controlled data. And we can withdraw this approval if agreements between us and the sponsor are violated or, of course, the product is not found to be safe and effective. The animal rule is found in 21 CFR 601 subpart H for biologics and 21 CFR 314 subpart I for drugs, provides a regulatory mechanism to approve drugs and license biologics when human studies are not ethical or feasible. The animal rule is not a simplified or expedited route to develop products. In fact, we have found that approval under the animal rule which can only be used when there is no other option, um, takes longer than everyone thought it would when it was first formed. The animal rule cannot be applied, as I just mentioned, when, when approval can be based on efficacy standards described anywhere else in FDA regulations. The animal rule can be applied to human drugs and biologicals, not devices or diagnostics, that are intended to reduce or prevent serious or life-threatening conditions caused by exposure to lethal or permanently disabling toxic chemical, biological, radiological, or nuclear substances. In addition, it has to have been determined that use of animal efficacy data is scientifically appropriate. The animal rule does not address human safety data, which still must be collected in human clinical trials. So the animal rule allows for the use of adequate and well-controlled animal studies as evidence of effectiveness for drug approval or biological licensure when these following four requirements are met. There is a reasonably well understood pathophysiological mechanism of the toxicity of the substance and its prevention or substantial reduction by the product. When the effect is demonstrated in more than one animal species expected to react with a response predictive for humans, 
unless the effect is demonstrated in a single animal species that represents a sufficiently well-characterized animal model for predicting the response in humans. When the animal study endpoint is clearly related to the desired benefit in humans, generally the enhancement of survival or prevention of major morbidity. And finally, when the data or information on the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the product or other relevant data or information in animals and humans allows the selection of an effective dose in humans. It is critical for all regulatory decision making to ensure the quality and the integrity of the data that forms the basis for that decision making. The principles of good laboratory practices regulations are a good example of a quality management system to ensure data quality and integrity. FDA recognizes that not all aspects of the GLP principles will be possible to follow for all studies and encourages discussion with the appropriate review division when designing these studies. It is important to remember that animal efficacy studies are surrogates for the normally required human data when pursuing approval under the animal rule. And the most important animal studies are the natural history studies, which are the model defining studies submitted for qualification should one want their animal model qualified. The adequate and well controlled efficacy studies, which provide the substantial evidence of effectiveness. And then the efficacy and PKPD studies that define the human dose and regimen. As I mentioned, the animal rule does not address safety evaluation of products, which still must be demonstrated in humans. And the pharmacokinetic and imaginicity data are also needed for, from humans, depending if we're talking a therapeutic drug or a um, vaccine. Approval under the animal rule is subject to post-marketing studies and FDA may impose restrictions on the use of products approved under the animal rule. In addition, the animal rule has its limitations. There may be no valid animal model of a specific disease. It can also be very difficult to bridge animal data to humans. And then just the general confidence that the public would have in a product approved using animal efficacy data versus human efficacy data. FDA has been, been planning and holding many workshops on different um, animal studies. Um, in addition, FDA reviewers are on several interagency animal study groups working in the development of animal models. So the risk benefit of each potential medical countermeasure differs. The FDA has to assess this individually for each product based on its potential use. So for instance, if your product is indicated to treat an otherwise untreatable serious illness, then it is reasonably likely to tolerate a significant risk and some uncertainty. However, if you have a product that's to be given as a prophylaxis to healthy individuals, whether pre or post an event, there is much less ability for FDA to tolerate any risk or uncertainty with regards to the use of the product. All products need transparent, balanced, and effective risk communication, and we have found through our experiences that that can be quite challenging in emergencies. Okay, so let's change a little bit and switch to the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. And specifically, CBER's efforts to facilitate um, vaccines, getting vaccines into clinical trials for Ebola. Ebola is an infectious, severe, acute viral illness in which the case fatality rate in past outbreaks has approached 
However, from the current outbreak, we note that the case fatality rate is highly linked to the availability of health care. The incubation period for Ebola averages 8 to 10 days from exposure to onset of symptoms, and that can range anywhere from 2 to 21 days. The current Ebola virus disease outbreak began in Guinea in December of 2013. In March of 2014, the Ministry of Health of Guinea notified the World Health Organization of the rapidly evolving Ebola virus disease outbreak. The U.S. government really started to engage in efforts to assist Africa on multiple fronts in August of 2014. But by now, the outbreak had also spread to Liberia, Sierra Leone, and in a limited manner to several other West African countries. Efforts to develop Ebola medical countermeasures significantly accelerated across the U.S. government industry and academia. And on August 7, 2014, the World Health Organization, Organization declared the 2014 Ebola virus disease outbreak a public health emergency of international concern. When the Ebola virus disease outbreak began, CBER had one active Ebola IND for a vaccine that was going nowhere really fast. CBER expected, expedited the review of the chemistry, manufacturing, and controls information, preclinical and clinical protocols, and then as it became available, clinical trial data for the Ebola vaccine candidates that started coming in the door. We provided early and rapid advice to our federal partners and manufacturers on clinical development pathways and clinical safety and efficacy data needed to advance development. And six months into our response, we went from that one IND that really wasn't being pursued to we had had eight pre-IND meetings for seven different Ebola vaccines and we had six new INDs in house, two master files, and two master files for five different vaccines, all allowed to proceed into clinical trials five to 14 days post submission. So, just to give these numbers some perspective, if you're industry and you're requesting a pre IND meeting with us, we typically schedule a type B pre-IND meeting, or sometimes we classify them a type C pre-IND meeting, 60 to 75 days respectfully from the day we get your official request. We were holding pre-IND meetings in less than 10 calendar days, including weekends, you know, from getting the request, if the request came in with the background information necessary for us to evaluate and answer the questions that sponsors had, because that's what a pre-IND meeting is. They have a list of questions for us, and then they submit the background material needed for us to evaluate and come up with a response to their questions. Also then, um, with regards to allowing the INDs to proceed so quickly, typically when a new investigational new drug submission is submitted to the agency, it contains a phase one protocol. We have 30 days, and in 30 days, if you, the sponsor, have not heard from us, you can start your clinical trial. So of course, we always respond by day 29 or 30, you know, or earlier, if, if we have the opportunity, that you may proceed or you cannot proceed, and here are the issues you need to address. So we were getting new INDs in on a Thursday or a Friday, reviewing them on the weekend, holding an internal meeting on Monday to determine if we all agreed that, yes, this clinical trial could proceed, and calling a sponsor Monday afternoon and saying, go. So. Um, Everyone in the U.S. government stepped up, but that's just an example how CBER helped get these vaccines forward into clinical trials. We also approved what we called 
I discussed earlier, I called them an EIND, an Emergency Expanded Access IND. We approved those for a specific vaccine that we got requests for it to be used as part of the treatment post-exposure prophylaxis of infected mostly healthcare workers and mostly those that had been extradited to the U.S. from West Africa who had gotten sick there and some of them had the vaccine in addition to other investigational treatments. There was also a huge international uh, effort, uh, collaboration going on to review Ebola files with our um, international regulatory counterparts. So that would be the European Medicines Agency and Health Canada, those are two of the big ones, plus numerous other smaller regulatory agencies. Um, with a goal of achieving regulatory convergence with regards to Ebola products, medical countermeasures moving forward. The international regulatory agencies also participated in WHO organized joint reviews with African regulators of phase two and phase three clinical trial protocols that were going to be conducted in various African countries. Um, FDA CBER also co-sponsored a workshop uh, on Ebola virus and vaccine immunology in December with the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, the Center for Disease Control, um, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, which is the office that does contracts and, and pushes forward medical countermeasures in the office of the Assistant Secretary for preparedness and response at HHS, as well as the Department of Defense. And then we held an advisory committee meeting for vaccines, those are called VRPAX, Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting in May of this year to discuss pathways to licensure for Ebola vaccine candidates. So with regards to the pathways to licensure under consideration still for all Ebola vaccine candidates, there is of course traditional approval um, where randomized controlled trials which are considered the gold standard in product development and demonstration of safety and efficacy demonstrate protection against clinical disease and one can measure an immunologic response. Also still under consideration, accelerated approval, which as I defined earlier, relies on inadequate and well-controlled clinical trials establishing an effect on a surrogate endpoint, in this case for Ebola vaccines and immune response, that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. And then it also requires the post-licensure studies, which are usually ongoing to confirm that clinical benefit. And then the animal rule is still an option. However, we need well-characterized animal models. There's a couple, but they're not well-characterized. Um, and post-marketing studies under the animal rule are also required. However, they aren't expected to be ongoing at the time of approval. Post-marketing studies to confirm clinical benefit for approval under the animal rule can occur when such studies are feasible or ethical. So if we had data that supported approval of an Ebola vaccine now under the animal rule, technically in the next outbreak, because there have been, what, 20 in the last 40 years, there's been quite a number of Ebola vaccine, out Ebola outbreaks, um, then um, technically that could be, uh, the clinical benefit of a product could be confirmed in the next outbreak. All of these uh, pathways though, whether traditional accelerated or animal rule, still all require the demonstration of safety in humans in clinical trials. So one year after the USG ramped up their efforts in the Ebola outbreak, we have three large phase three clinical trials ongoing in West Africa, 
two of those under USIND. The two under USIND are designed to assess vaccine efficacy based on clinical disease endpoints and serum samples are being collected for immunogenicity analysis. So the ongoing trials, one is being conducted by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. It's a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized controlled trial in Liberia with two different vaccines, and it started in February. The Centers for Disease Control is conducting an unblinded, randomized trial with phased introduction of a single vaccine in Sierra Leone, and it began in April. And then the trial that is not under USIND is the one being conducted by the WHO, and it is a ring vaccination trial in Guinea with a single vaccine, and that started in March. So we have been working with our U.S. government partners and manufacturers to develop and validate the assays for case ascertainment and to measure immune responses so that we can compare these things across different studies with different vaccines. And of course, because we moved these experimental vaccines into clinical trials so quickly, we're still catching up on the manufacturing issues and the CMC issues. Today, CBER has 10 active INDs for seven different Ebola vaccines, all in various stages of development from phase one to phase three clinical trials. And we've held pre-IND meetings for another seven different vaccines of which we still expect the INDs will come in the door. So in summary, we've been proactively facilitating the development, licensure, and approval and availability of new countermeasures. The medical countermeasures, however, that we developed to protect us from potential terrorist attacks or emerging infectious disease need to adhere to the same principles of safety and efficacy. However, bioterrorism and emerging infectious diseases are new, are, are moving targets with no predictable epidemiology, yet the public still expects safe and effective products and expects the same from those used in an emergency. So as we try to do at FDA, we believe it is important to preserve the confidence in medical products and public health leadership to facilitate, uh, to facilitate response to any public health emergency. And that's it, thank you very much. I uh, have uh, three slides here at the end that has a whole listing of relevant guidance as well as new regulations, et cetera, that have been done over the last uh, decade in order to facilitate um, medical countermeasure development. Thank you. Okay, I, I, at first I want to thank Cindy for that spectacular talk, and we learned quite a lot. Um, I'm opening this up for some questions. Questions? Yes, sir. Um, so you uh, mentioned about the animal models, and the, the whole ones are not particularly well characterized. What, uh, can you give us some suggestions as to what kinds of characterization you'd like to see for a well-characterized animal model? So um, most animal model development, of course, has been starting with a natural history study. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of work going on with that, but the filoviruses are, you know, another whole animal all of themselves with everything having to be done in BSL-4 laboratories. So the development of well-characterized animal models is the development of an animal model that allows you to meet those four requirements that are in that are in the animal rule itself and it's very different depending not only on the product as to whether it was a therapeutic or a vaccine but on the agent itself and so i couldn't 
it's one of those review issues that we work with sponsors on, et cetera. Plus, of course, the U.S. government, um, National Institutes of Health, Department of Defense, um, BARDA down at HHS, they're all facilitating the development of animal models for all kinds of threat agents, for radiological, for the, bio, for the various biologicals, chemical, to approve various countermeasures for specific indications, et cetera. And so really the effort to develop animal models is largely driven by the U.S. government and then with assistance from industry and academia, depending on their specific interest. I can't, but Sally can. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.